it makes sense, being I worked on Toy Story 1, Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3, every one of the Toy Story specials and every one of the Toy Story shorts, that this is where my story would begin. My family has owned toy stores in the San Francisco Bay Area for a very long time. Now, when I say very long, my mom and dad owned the toy stores. My grandfather and grandmother owned the toy stores. My great-grandfather and my great-grandmother owned the toy stores. And then my great-great-grandfather, he actually owned a cigar shop in San Francisco. <laughs> His name was Charlie. We don't usually talk about Charlie. He was a little notorious. Uh, but that over there is my dad and my grandfather. I grew up in a toy store, surrounded by toys. Not a bad uh, childhood, you know? So this is my dad. That's a Smurf. That's my dad right there. And <laughs> you know, even my dad, who was really, really lucky to have uh, his parents and his grandparents own toy stores, uh, he wanted to be a Disney animator. His entire life, he drew, uh, went to Vietnam, came back when he told his father, my grandfather, that he wanted to be a Disney animator and go to LA. That didn't go over so well. It's the family business, we need for you to, to keep running the family business. So my dad kind of just stuffed it, uh, stuffed it down and, and didn't do anything about it until I came around. I should also mention my mom is from Germany, okay, and she would dress me up in Lederhosen. <laughs> and while other kids would go to school with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, I would go to school with liverwurst sandwiches. And, but when I was a little kid, uh, I must have inherited that love of drawing because my dad, uh, he was sick, he was homesick. And I was about three years old, and I drew this picture for my dad. You can see the stomach ache in the middle. <laughs> and when my dad saw this drawing, even when I'm three years old, I have a daughter who's almost three. My dad was like the Terminator and was just like, boop, 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 boop. you will live my dream. <laughs> and I'm telling you, from that point on, my dad took me to see every movie that was animated, of course, but he would also take me to see live action movies, whether they were appropriate for kids or not. Taking your kid to see Poltergeist at five is not a good idea, <laughs> but I am not kidding around. My mom would drop me off at school and my dad would pick me up later in the day saying I had another dentist appointment so we could go see the bargain matinee and not have to sit with a bunch of other people in the theater. My dad taught me how to draw. He was my, my teacher, my mentor. He, 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 he poured on his love of art and animation and filmmaking and story onto me. So this only made me more and more in love with animation and art and story, which led me to this school in LA called CalArts. Now this school was started by Walt Disney before Walt Disney passed away. And the, and the whole purpose of this school was to train the next generation of animators, filmmakers, artists to come work for Disney. I knew that this was the school I wanted to go to. Now, not everybody's heard of this school, but almost every director, writer, animator at Pixar and Disney has gone to this school. And this was the number of our animation department, A113. Now, chances are, if you've watched a Pixar movie, like Jennifer and her family enough, you will see this A113 show up in every one of the Pixar films. Yes, we do sneak in things in the films. And not only uh, does this happen in Disney Pixar films, but guys like Tim Burton and so many other people went to CalArts as well. Well, when I was at the school, I worked really, really hard. My family, the business family, thought it would be a really good idea to not pay for my college and make me do it myself, the strong work, work ethic one thing. So when I went to school, I made absolutely sure not to waste a single moment. I made a student film called Stuart Schuyler Saves the Day, and The Simpsons saw it, and they uh, offered me a job to be an animator on The Simpsons. I was 19 years old. 
would I leave school to go work on The Simpsons? Naturally, I would. So I left school, worked on The Simpsons as an animator. I, I loved the experience, but what I really loved was I discovered the process of how they were writing the show. Okay, does anybody recognize anybody in this shot of writers? You can see Conan back there eating pizza and drinking a Coke. And this was how they were writing the episodes for The Simpsons. It was like a brainstorm session, improv, very Saturday Night Live kind of experience. Everybody bouncing ideas off each other. And when I saw this process, I fell in love with this. I knew I wanted to do story. But how? How was I going to do this? Well, I later was offered a job to work at a very small animation company of only about 80 people in the San Francisco area. And they were going to make the very first CG animated movie called Toy Story. And they wanted to train animators how to animate on a computer. I, I can't even remember why I agreed to do this, but I did. And I was hired as one of the first 12 animators. It was an awesome experience. Uh, some of the scenes I got to animate were ones like this. This was our early version of collecting data, filming ourselves. And, and that's a joke, by the way. And what I did was I took a board, like a snowboard, screwed my high tops on it, and then jumped around, fell down, crawled up on things to be able to get the acting correct for the Army men. But as I'm animating from the storyboards, Again, I'm like, I really want to do story. What am I doing? So I kept asking at Pixar, can I do story? Can I do this? They said, you don't have the experience. Eventually, I whined so much that they eventually let me be a storyboard artist. And then I became a part of that group at Pixar over 20 years ago that ended up working on all the Toy Story movies, the Monsters movies, Nemo, Up, Ratatouille, Cars, all those that you've probably seen a couple times with your kids or by yourself. And I love story. Story is what I'm most passionate about. You know, sometimes when you do something and you just know this is what I was meant to do, that's what it is for me. It's story. And we all have great stories to tell. And while stories are what make films great and are the TV shows and books, story is what also makes companies great and help us communicate with people. Stories matter. You know, stories break through the noise and help us decide what to believe in, especially in a world now where there's so much noise on the internet, so many options, so many things to, to pick, to choose. Sometimes we don't know what to choose. Stories help us make those decisions. And stories are so meaningful because they're memorable, they're impactful, and they're personal. Some of you guys are not going to like to hear this, but when you give out information, data, and statistics, after it's done, 10 minutes goes by, only 5% of that group of people remember any of the data and statistics you gave out. Is that a good feeling for you? Well, maybe not. What you need to do is you need to be able to tell the data and statistics through a story. Because when you tell a story connected with the information, people, 63% of that group, remember it. Even with this Tiffany ad, you know, if you were going to go buy a diamond, there's all the data and statistics of the cut of the diamond, the clarity, the four Cs. But the reason why we go to Tiffany, or my wife tells me to go to Tiffany, is because it's, 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 about, it's about love. There's a story there. That's why we, we choose to do that. The story helps us remember the statistics. It's actually 22 times more memorable than facts alone. A story closes a deal, not the facts. People will not remember the data and statistics. They're going to remember how you made them feel through a story. You know. Stories are also very impactful. It, there's a science behind good storytelling. When you actually look at the chemicals in people's tears, when they're watching a film and they have tears of joy or tears of sadness, the chemicals in the tears are different. Stories 
impact our happy and sad chemicals. They will make you feel a certain way, whether you're watching a film, reading a book, TV, or hearing a story from somebody else. Those happy chemicals like dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, oxytocin, they make us feel good. So when we see characters happy, feeling good, achieving goals, being heroes, it makes us feel good. And when we watch characters not doing well, that releases the cortisol. And what makes a great story, trust me, I've, I've learned about this by, by doing it firsthand, when you end up releasing happy chemicals and then cortisol, sad kind of chemicals, and you do this up and down tension and release, it puts people through this um, kind of roller coaster ride. And then at the end, you leave them on a high note and you, you make them feel a certain way, a positive way. I fly a lot, and a lot of times when I'm in the plane, especially for really long, long flights, I start to get a little depressed. The cortisol is taking me down. I'm missing my family, and what do I do? I look at pictures on my phone to boost up those happy chemicals, to make me feel good, to remember moments in my life, my kids, things that, that's happened. That's my son when he was a little bit younger. He's older now, he's 16. He's this tall, <laughs> but he was like that one time. And this is my daughter, and she does look like that still, and she is adorable. Um, but when I'm depressed in a plane, feeling a little distant from my family, I look at those photos, and it boosts up the happy chemicals. So when I bought my car, which has the worst gas mileage, it's supposed to have the top rating of cars that flip over, I didn't really care about the data and statistics on that. I was like, I want that Jeep because I had that toy when I was a kid and it made me feel really good and it brings back a lot of good memories. And I like the idea of Jeeps being like Indiana Jones and Jurassic Park and adventure. A lot of times we make choices because it makes us feel good. Whether it's from, I wanna eat that donut because I'm gonna feel good or whether it's bigger decisions, like who you're gonna vote for. Uh, are, are you gonna buy a new house? Are you going to make a decision with a lot of money? You make those decisions because you're feeling good at the time. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have my whole family from my daughter who's two to my grandfather who's 92. Wow, I didn't think about that, 90 years, wow. We get together for dinner once a week. And at these Lund dinners, we always talk about politics, we talk about the toy stores, and I remember when Obama was coming up for re-election, and we were taking the, the consensus of who's gonna vote for who, and we thought, okay, let's ask the teenager, my son, who are you gonna vote for? It's like, duh, I'm voting for Obama. It's like, why? He plays basketball, right? We make big decisions because we connect with people because we like them. They make us feel good. I mean, it's no mistake that Bill Clinton is up playing his sax. He's a musician, I like music. So these big decisions and small decisions that we make, we make them with the right side of our brain. This is the feel good side of your brain. This is the artistic, creative side of the brain. When we make decisions, they're made with our feelings. And then later on, we rationalize later with the left side of our brain. We don't make decisions because they're logical, we make decisions because they feel good. And when you tell a good story that makes people feel something and inspires them and they are emotional and moved, they not only connect and remember that story, but they also connect with you as a speaker. So all of a sudden, people like Steve Jobs, Walt Disney, they tell great stories, but then you also become personally connected with those storytellers. You like them, you have confidence in them, you believe them. You know, I, I was really fortunate to work with Steve all the way up to when he passed away. And most of the conversations I had with Steve was, we're all in a meeting like this, and then we break out and we go to lunch and we talk about our kids and we talk about life. That's what most of my conversations with Steve. 
But whenever he gave a talk to the company, he used storytelling all the time. He was not a guy who got into the data and statistics. I remember one time, Toy Story was very, very successful, okay? Toy Story was released 20 years ago, uh, like in 2015, believe it or not. And after Toy Story was released, it was a big hit. We were making Bugs Life, and there was all these new directors wanting to get their chance to direct a movie. And there was a lot of tension going on. Who's getting it more money? Who's gonna get to put their movie out first? And Steve, without arguing, the wise man that he was, he simply said, just imagine that every one of our movies that we're gonna put out is like a boat hooked up to the dock by the in the water, and when the water goes up, all the boats are gonna go up. And if the water goes down, all the boats are gonna go down. He says, if we all support each other and make sure that every one of our movies is gonna be great, the water's gonna go up and we're all gonna succeed. And the arguing stopped. We all realized we are all in this together. If we all make the company great, we're gonna succeed. If we argue, it's gonna go down. We connected with Steve and we believed in him and I really believe that's what made Pixar so great and still great is that leadership. So now, how do we create an inspiring story? If you're here, I guarantee you're here because you do already tell good stories. I, I, I guarantee it. But there's a couple of things I wanted to share with you just to plus what you're doing. And, you know, a lot of these have the same similarities in the film world, okay? The premise, the hook, when we're pitching stories at Pixar or, or when I'm working with other directors at other companies and helping them develop an idea, what it all comes down to in the very beginning with story is hooking your audience. You guys know that. When, you, when you're speaking to somebody, if you don't hook them in the beginning, catch their attention, you're gonna lose them. We call that a premise. This here, are all little drawings from movies that we've made. They all start with an idea. We call this um, a what if. It's, it's what ifs, like a hook, and asks a question. For example, superheroes who are banned from saving people. Does anybody know what movie that is, by the way? Okay, very good. Um, okay, here's one that's a little more difficult. A man that hunts robots falls in love with him, love with one. Blade Runner, oh, very good, all right, good. Um, a rat that wants to be a French chef. Okay, ratitude, good. So when you are pitching an idea or you're trying to hook somebody into a story, you have a very short period of time before they lose interest, right? Kind of like the, the, the attention span of a little kid. Sometimes we call that the elevator pitch like if you got in an elevator and you were there with Steven Spielberg and you wanted to pitch him your amazing idea, you would have to pitch him your idea before he gets out of the elevator. Very short period of time to get people's attention. And when you come up with a hook, it's always great that it's something that's personal to you. How many people saw Inside Out? Okay, good. Inside Out was a personal story. The director of that film, his daughter, when she was young, she was a silly, goofy little monkey that would be run around and, and they, they, were, they were best friends. And then she turned 12. And she put on her hoodie, she put it in her earbuds, and she sat in the corner of her room and just said, get out, leave me alone, you don't understand, I love him. Things like that, right? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know if I'm prepared for this, but... So the director was like, what is going on in my daughter's head? And he is Joy, the, the girl, the yellow girl up there. He was telling it, the story from her point of view. What goes on inside of people's heads to make these decisions? When you want to tell a story, you want to make it personal, something that's important to you. Here are some other what if, uh, what if premise ideas, but these aren't from films. Let's see if we can guess what companies these are. 
A company, what if a company, someone already said it, hmm, what if a company could organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful? Google, okay. What if a company could serve the very best sustainably raised Mexican food possible with an eye to great taste, nutrition, and value? Oh, good. Nobody said talk, uh, Taco Bell. Okay, all right. What if a company created electric cars with aesthetically attractive designs? Good. See, all of these ideas are a hook. I pitched it to you in, in just like 10 seconds. And when you have a great idea, that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that you can hook people into your story, your idea, as quickly as possible. One of the things that's happening in this hook is that the character in the story is changing, or you're changing the audience. You're telling the audience, wouldn't you like to have some other option than Taco Bell to go eat at? Wouldn't you like to have a car that's still cool and doesn't run off fossil fuels? You're trying to change the audience. This is what I've been doing for years. Great stories are all about characters changing. When you tell your story, and the reason why I want to listen to your story is because you're going through a change. When we create our movies, they are all about characters changing. A top scarer at a monster comp uh, a, at a scaring company ends up discovering the kids aren't toxic, they're not evil, and he ends up risking losing his job, his best friend, being banished in order to do the right thing and say, scaring kids is not okay. How he changed? He went from naive to becoming aware. That is why you love those movies. Finding Nemo, somebody who went from being overprotective, an overprotective parent, to being a parent that can let their kids live their life. It's all about change. And when we tell a good story, whether it's personal, professional, a movie, TV show, book, when you tell a story with a character changing, the audience, whoever you're talking to, puts themselves in the shoes of a rat, a car, a toy, whatever the main character is, or you. They go on that journey with you.